Okay, I think we will get started. This is going to be our third keynote. So, hello everybody. Uh, welcome back. If you're new, welcome uh, to the Mediating Scale Conference. So from me and my co-organizer, Magdalena Krzysztofowska, it's really nice to have you here. My name is Oliver Kenny, uh, and I'm delighted to be the chair for this session. As I said, our third keynote presentation uh, of the conference. Um, before I introduce the speaker, just some quick housekeeping. Uh, please note that this session is being recorded. Uh, after the main presentation, we will have roughly half an hour for discussion. So please do post your questions in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom, uh, and we'll try to put as many of them as we can to our speaker. Uh, please try to formulate your questions concisely, and please make sure to use that Q&A feature uh, for your questions rather than the chat. Okay, so Laura, are you ready? Yes, here I am. Uh, let's just, uh, oh, sorry, there we go. Um, excellent. Okay, so uh, Laura Trapaldi uh, is a researcher in material science and nanotechnology at the University of Milano Bicocca, uh, where she works on the design of hybrid nanomaterials and the study of their processes of self-assembly for advanced technological applications. And she recently received her, her doctorate, so congratulations to you on that. Uh, parallel to her academic research, she writes about speculative and philosophical aspects of science and technology, with a particular focus on the concepts of complexity, self-organization, art artificial life, softness, and material interfaces. She is a contributor to several online magazines, and her book, Parallel Minds, which I've got a copy of here, Discovering the Intelligence of Materials, was published by Urbanomic uh, this year, 2022. So today, uh, Laura is going to be uh, giving a talk entitled Self-Assembling Matter, Synthesizing Agency at the Nanoscale. And on that, I hand over to you. So thank you very much, Oliver, for your introduction and um, good afternoon, everybody. So I will share my screen for my presentation. All right. I hope everyone can see it. Yeah, that's um, great. Great. Um, okay, so um, the title of my talk, um, as Oliver said, is uh, Self-Assembling Matter Synthesizing Agency at the Nanoscale. Um, and um, the focus of my talk, uh, of course, uh, will be a discussion about um, the, the nanoscale itself. Uh, so we will start by trying to define uh, what the nanoscale is uh, uh, and uh, what is a nanomaterial, uh, trying to give you an idea of uh, um, the space where nanotechnology actually works. Um, then uh, um, I will try to introduce you uh, to a brief uh, history of uh, nanotechnology. Um, and this is, I think, uh, uh, especially relevant um, because uh, uh, the history of nanotechnology is actually uh, quite controversial in a certain way. Um, I believe that uh, um, nanotechnology is uh, maybe uh, one of the most uh, misunderstood fields of technology. Um, I myself, uh, before starting to work in the field of uh, nanotechnology and nanomaterials, um, I didn't have a very clear idea of uh, what nanotechnology was all about. Uh, and I think this is because uh, there are a lot of misconceptions um, that were um, that emerged, let's say, during the history of uh, of this field of science, uh, that are still uh, um, very strong and very influential today. So I will try to explain uh, to you some of these misconceptions and the origins of these misconceptions, uh, and then I will also try to show you, um, uh, on the contrary, what actually now technology is all about. Uh, and to do this, uh, um, I will focus uh, mostly on the concept of uh, uh, self-assembly. Uh, and uh, I believe that self-assembly uh, is really one of the most uh, um, fascinating uh, uh, concepts um, that is not uh, actually exclusive to nanotechnology and the nanoscale. 
uh, self-assembly and self-organization can actually uh, take place uh, at all scales, uh, even the macroscopic scale or the planetary scale, and there are several examples of this. Uh, but because of the nature uh, of the nanoscale and because of the nature of nanomaterials, uh, um, self-assembly becomes uh, especially relevant uh, as a technological strategy uh, to achieve control uh, on the nanoscale. Uh, so uh, I hope that I will be able to explain to you uh, the concept of self-assembly uh, in general. Uh, and then uh, I hope that I will be able to uh, give you an idea of how nanotechnology can actually uh, help us uh, uh, developing uh, uh, more effective uh, self-assembly strategies uh, in technology. Uh, and so in the end, uh, after introducing all of these concepts uh, um, relating to nanotechnology, um, I will try to give you an idea of uh, how nanotechnology and the nanoscale can actually become uh, a new paradigm for technology as a whole. Um, I will give you some examples of uh, technologies at the nanoscale. Um, and I will try to show you uh, in what way uh, working at the nanoscale can actually help us uh, uh, to subvert uh, some of uh, uh, our ideas uh, uh, around the technology. Uh, and also this might help us uh, to, um, to, to develop new um, innovative approaches to technology uh, that maybe uh, we don't often uh, think about. Uh, so I will start by giving you um, an introduction about the nanoscale in general. Um, and maybe you already have uh, an idea of uh, what the nanoscale is uh, and what is a nanomaterial. Uh, but um, overall, uh, it's not really easy, I find, uh, uh, trying to get uh, an intuitive uh, uh, perspective of uh, how small actually a nanometer is and how small actually a nanomaterial is. Uh, in general, uh, nanomaterials are defined as any materials that have at least one of their dimensions uh, in the range between one nanometer and 100 nanometers. So one nanometer uh, is one billionth of a meter. Uh, and this uh, maybe doesn't tell you much uh, intuitively. Uh, so to give you uh, some kind of perspective, uh, here is uh, a scale that you might often find uh, uh, when discussing about nanotechnology. And you can see that the nanoscale is exactly this region here highlighted in blue. Uh, and it is a region that is located in between uh, the scale of uh, atoms and molecules uh, and uh, uh, the scale of the smallest uh, living organisms, so bacteria. Um, so the nanoscale is this uh, space in between, um, in between the space of uh, chemistry, let's say, and the space of biology. Um, and so in the range of the nanoscale, um, you can find uh, uh, all the materials that actually uh, are the main components of uh, life itself. Uh, so for instance, uh, uh, proteins, uh, um, biological macromolecules, uh, viruses, uh, and even DNA itself uh, are uh, um, materials or objects uh, that exist uh, in the nanoscale. Uh, and this can already give you some kind of idea of why nanotechnology and the nanoscale is so interesting because it gives us access to working at the scale of the main components of, uh, of life. Uh, but nanotechnology, of course, uh, deals uh, not only uh, with uh, natural materials, but also with uh, artificial materials. And here are some examples of artificial nanomaterials or nanoparticles. Um, there are uh, an infinite, uh, infinite amount, actually, of, of different kinds of nanoparticles with different functions. Uh, and I hope that during this talk, you will get an idea of uh, um, some of these, uh, some of these uh, nano objects. So nanomaterials can be either natural uh, or artificial. Um, or even somewhere in between. Uh, a lot of nanomaterials uh, actually mix uh, uh, elements of biological systems and artificial systems together, uh, precisely because of their scale. Um, the nanoscale uh, um, is especially interesting uh, because uh, um, 
let's say that at the scale where nanomaterials exist, uh, uh, ordinary physical forces that act on all macroscopic bodies uh, um, seem to result uh, in different effects uh, compared to macroscopic bodies. So even though, of course, all bodies respond uh, to the same uh, physical forces, at the nanoscale, we can observe some different effects that are actually specific to the nanoscale and that uh, you will not find at the macro scale. Uh, some of the most uh, significant examples uh, of, uh, of this uh, special behavior, let's say, of nanomaterials are, uh, for instance, uh, quantum effects. Um, and this is something that um, is very often uh, talk, talked about in the field of nanotechnology, but actually um, there are very few uh, examples of nanomaterials uh, that uh, uh, exhibit uh, quantum effects. Uh, one example of this uh, is uh, quantum dots uh, that are often used uh, in quantum computing, but most uh, nanomaterials uh, uh, do not exhibit uh, uh, quantum effects. But uh, quantum effects are not the only kinds of physical effects uh, that are specific to the nanoscale. There is a lot of other effects um, that are, uh, in my opinion, uh, might even be considered more interesting that, than quantum effects, even though they are often a bit uh, more neglected. Uh, so for instance, um, uh, let's consider viscosity. Um, viscosity uh, has a very different impact on nanomaterials compared to macroscopic bodies. Uh, because of their scale, nanomaterials uh, are impacted by viscosity in a much more, um, in a much more significant way. Uh, the same is true for electrostatic interactions between body uh, and gravity. Uh, the reason why all of these uh, ordinary physical forces have such a strong effect uh, on nanomaterials uh, um, has to do uh, with surface. Uh, so overall, uh, surface effects uh, are the reason why nanomaterials uh, are so special uh, compared to ordinary macroscopic bodies. Uh, and this might not be uh, intuitive uh, uh, to understand, so I will try to explain this to you by using this diagram. Um, I would say that really nanoscience uh, might be defined as the study of surfaces uh, and uh, the ensemble of technologies that we can use for the technological modification of surfaces. Uh, I believe that the importance of surfaces uh, in uh, uh, nanotechnology uh, really cannot be uh, overstated. Uh, and this is because uh, um, by reducing the size of objects, uh, we are actually um, exponentially multiplying uh, their surface. Um, and this might be kind of uh, counterintuitive in a way. Um, uh, you can wonder uh, how is it possible that by making something smaller, we actually obtain such a much bigger surface, uh, and maybe you can understand this by looking at, by looking at this uh, at this drawing. So, if we have a cube of any kind of material uh, with a one centimeter size, um, we uh, we will have a one centimeter um, uh, cubic one cubic centimeter of of material with a surface area of six centimeters squared. Uh, if we decide to split uh, this cube of material into smaller cubes, uh, for example, uh, 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 cubes of uh, one millimeter side, side uh, we will have a 60 centimeter square total surface area. If we reduce uh, the size of these small pieces to one nanometer, we will obtain a total surface area of uh, uh, 60 million centimeters square. So by keeping the same exact volume of matter and the same exact mass of matter, we can actually obtain um, a, a surface area that is uh, exponentially larger. Uh, and this is important because if we increase uh, the surface area that we have uh, available uh, to us, uh, um, we can actually increase uh, the complexity of the materials uh, that we are dealing with. Uh, so complexity is not um, a simple concept uh, to define, <laughs> of course, um, and uh, there are many definitions of complexity. Uh, one definition that I think is uh, effective uh, in this context uh, um, is the idea that complexity is uh, the amount of information that might be encoded in a designated volume of matter. Um, and so by increasing the amount of surface that we have in a certain volume of matter, we can actually increase the amount 
amount of information that we can store inside this same amount of matter. And this is especially relevant in the case of living systems. And this is why living systems are actually nanostructured objects, um, because they need to store uh, such large amounts of, uh, of information uh, in order to maintain their complex uh, structure and their complex functions. So surface is really uh, the most important concept of, uh, of nanotechnology and nanoscience. Uh, and um, not only um, surface uh, in nanotechnology is a really important uh, concept. Uh, I also think that uh, um, nanotechnology and material science um, introduce uh, um, a different idea of surface uh, compared to the conventional idea that we have of surfaces. Uh, and to try to explain this, uh, uh, I think it's useful to look at this uh, diagram here on the left. Uh, so you can see here at the, on the left uh, that we have two bodies, uh, the blue one and the yellow one that are in contact with one another. Uh, and you can see here this line uh, somehow depicts uh, the different properties of, uh, of these two bodies. And we can see that there is a, a really clear distinction between the two bodies. There is a really clear boundary a really clear surface that separates the two bodies. Uh, but actually, uh, material science and chemistry and nanotechnology actually teach us that these kinds of surfaces um, actually do not really exist. Uh, in reality, uh, when we are dealing with the actual material systems, uh, we do not have such uh, um, ideal uh, um, surfaces. Uh, and the rigid boundaries between, uh, between different bodies. But actually, uh, what we have uh, is a, a material space where the properties of the two bodies uh, actually mix, uh, um, somehow mix uh, with one another. Um, and this is why, uh, typically, in chemistry and in material science, uh, we do not talk about surfaces, uh, but we, rad we rather talk uh, about uh, interfaces. And interfaces are not exactly surfaces. They are actually material spaces with a certain thickness, with a certain volume, uh, and with their own specific materiality, um, in which uh, the properties of two bodies are somehow mixed uh, together. Uh, and this is especially important in the case of nanotechnology, because we have to understand that by working with nanomaterials, we are not only increasing the extension of surfaces, uh, but we are also increasing uh, the possibility of uh, this uh, interaction, let's say. We are increasing the possibility of creating uh, uh, new uh, relational networks uh, of matter. And this is why nanotechnology is uh, such a promising approach uh, to, to, te to technology and to material systems. Um, one example that might help us understand uh, the concept of the interface in a more practical way uh, is the example of the water droplet. Uh, I especially like this example because I think it makes it very clear. Uh, you can see here in this uh, picture that uh, the same water droplet uh, changes its behavior depending on the surface uh, on which uh, uh, it, uh, it is deposited. Uh, so you can see that here, for example, it has a much more spherical shape. Uh, and then by changing the, the properties of the surface, uh, we have a completely different behavior. Um, and this is why, uh, actually, this property of water the contact angle, so the, the, let's say the angle that the water droplet forms with the surface is not inherent to water itself, but it is an emerging property of the interaction between the water droplet and the surface. And so this is, um, I think, a practical example of what an interface uh, actually is. Uh, so after introducing uh, these uh, concepts, uh, this, these are some of the main, uh, the core concepts, let's say, of, of nanotechnology, I would like to move on to a brief uh, history of, uh, of nanotechnology itself. Um, and um, often, um, let's say that uh, nanotechnology has uh, its own, uh, uh, like many sciences, nanotechnology has its own uh, founding myth, uh, let's say, foundational myth. Uh, and the foundational myth of nanotechnology uh, is uh, this um, talk uh, that was uh, given by Richard Feynman in 1959, 
titled Plenty of Room at the Bottom. Uh, in this talk, uh, uh, Richard Feynman uh, speculates uh, on the possibility of working uh, at a very small scale, the nanoscale. Uh, even though Feynman never uses the word nanotechnology in this talk, uh, um, he uh, somehow starts to, um, to speculate completely theoretically uh, about the possibility of uh, manipulating matter uh, at a very small scale. Um, so this talk is often considered uh, as the starting point of nanotechnology, uh, but uh, somehow the view of the nanoscale that is presented is, in this talk uh, um, is very limited compared to what nanotechnology actually came to be, uh, and its influence on the actual development of nanotechnology uh, is still uh, quite controversial. So I will tell you, um, I will introduce some of the main points that uh, Richard Feynman makes in this talk, um, and uh, then by the end of this lecture, I will also maybe try to, um, we, we will look at these points again, uh, and we will see how they compare to uh, the reality of uh, nanotechnology and nanomaterials. Um, so uh, the first point that uh, Richard Feynman makes uh, is uh, complexity. So uh, according to Richard Feynman, uh, nanotechnology is important or working at the nanoscale is important because it, may give, it might give us a lot of information about uh, um, complex systems. Uh, and I would say that this is true uh, also in relation to, what's, to what I told you before about uh, the, the ability of nanotechnology of, uh, um, of uh, exponentially expanding uh, uh, surfaces. Uh, the second point that Feynman makes um, uh, has to do with information. And maybe you might have heard of this idea around nanotechnology. Uh, it is the idea uh, that by working at the nanoscale, uh, we will exponentially increase the amount of information that we can store um, inside of, uh, of matter, inside of uh, material objects. And in a way, um, this is, of course, uh, true. Again, it has to do with uh, this idea of the surface and the interface. But, but what I find especially interesting uh, about the perspective of Feynman is that uh, what he means by information is really, um, he refers to actually writing. Um, he refers to some kind of actual lithography um, at the nanoscale. So actually writing, for example, the whole Encyclopedia Britannica uh, on the head of a pin. Um, so this is um, some kind of, uh, I would say this is kind of a limited view of what uh, the relationship between the matter and the information might be. Uh, then uh, Feynman speaks about miniaturization uh, and his idea of miniaturization um, and the, the idea, let's say, of the concept of miniaturization is taking certain technologies that exist on the macro scale uh, and uh, um, transforming them and turning them in the same exact technologies, the same exact machines, but uh, on a much smaller scale. So the idea of Feynman is exactly, uh, for instance, trying to build uh, um, tiny, um, tiny cars, uh, tiny um, machines, uh, uh, tiny engines. So he, he really thinks of uh, replicating the same technologies that we have at the macro scale on the nano scale. Uh, and this to me, um, I, I, I mean, I believe that this was actually a very influential uh, perspective, also kind of in a negative way, because this view of nanotechnology uh, as uh, the same exact uh, replication of macroscopic technologies on a small scale actually had um, I think contributed to a lot of misconceptions uh, around what nanotechnology actually is. And uh, I will show you this maybe a bit better later on. Uh, and finally, the last point is direct manipulation. So according to Feynman, uh, the final goal of nanotechnology would be um, directly manipulating atoms and molecules. Uh, so essentially, um, he wanted to, or he imagined a future in which uh, scientists 
would be able to actually move around individual atoms and molecules to build uh, any kind of uh, chemical structures uh, uh, they wanted. So this uh, is um, really an idea of technology in which uh, human uh, action, uh, human intervention is really the protagonist. Um, and um, this is uh, somehow in contrast uh, with uh, the concept of uh, self-assembly that I will try to explain to you later on, uh, that really became actually the the prevalent, uh, um, the prevalent approach of, uh, of nanotechnology. Um, so after Feynman's uh, talk, uh, between the 80s and the 90s, uh, um, the term nanotechnology actually was popularized by a scientist called uh, Eric Drexler. Uh, and Eric Drexler uh, somehow borrowed some of the uh, elements uh, of uh, Richard Feynman's talk uh, and tried to develop them further into his own idea of nanotechnology. Uh, Drexler's view of nanotechnology was uh, based on, uh, again, the possibility of uh, manipulating matter with atomic precision. So the idea of new moving individual atoms and molecules around uh, with uh, tiny hands and the tiny machines uh, in order to completely um, manipulate matter in any, uh, in any possible way. Um, uh, also, there were some elements uh, of uh, biomimicry, let's say, in uh, Eric Drexler's idea of nanotechnology. Uh, his idea was trying to, um, to imitate and replicate the behavior, for example, of certain biological structures, such as uh, enzymes and proteins, uh, but uh, doing the same also with other kinds of uh, non-biological materials, um, especially hard materials, uh, such as metals uh, and silicon. And uh, all of this um, view of nanotechnology that was developed by Eric Drexler uh, somehow could in, the, in this uh, speculative machine um, called the self-replicating uh, nanobot. Uh, and uh, the nanobot, uh, the concept or the idea of the nanobot uh, has been uh, one of the most uh, influential uh, cultural images around the nanotechnology, um, even though actually uh, no nanobot uh, has ever been constructed to this day. Um, and also uh, nanobots uh, really somehow uh, miss the point of uh, what nanotechnology can actually effectively do. Uh, so Eric Drexler's idea was, uh, again, similarly to what Richard Feynman proposed, uh, uh, trying to imagine uh, nanotechnology as uh, the possibility of building uh, uh, tiny machines, uh, essentially. Um, microscopic equivalents of uh, uh, macroscopic machines uh, that would be able to manipulate matter on the atomic uh, uh, scale. Uh, the possibility of manipulating atoms and molecules individually uh, actually was realized in the 1980s. Uh, there is a technology uh, known as the scanning tunneling microscope uh, that allows us uh, to uh, individually move around uh, atoms and molecules. Uh, you can see here some examples of this. Uh, this is the IBM logo that was realized by moving around individual xenon atoms. And this is a, a tiny movie uh, that was uh, realized by essentially capturing pictures of uh, um, carbon monoxide molecules. So each of these tiny balls is actually a carbon monoxide molecule that was moved around by using a scanning tunneling microscope. Uh, and then the image was captured to build up this kind of uh, stop motion movie. So we do have the technology for individual manipulation of atoms and molecules. And, uh, there are, of course, uh, some potential applications of this, uh, but actually uh, the, um, the real possibilities of nanotechnologies uh, um, went, uh, I would say, in a much different uh, direction. Um, so again, to reinforce this idea or this misconception around the nanotechnology, uh, if you look up uh, nanotechnology on Google Images, uh, you will uh, encounter a lot of these uh, depictions uh, of uh, nanobots. Um, and uh, I really think that uh, these images are really somehow um, uh, relevant because they give us an idea of, uh, of our perception, uh, the public perception of nanotechnology. Um, and what we see in these images is actually a reproduction of uh, um, our uh, concept of robot, the macroscopic uh, 
uh, robot made of hard materials uh, such as steel and silicon and glass, uh, but reproduced uh, on a much smaller scale. Um, but um, actually, nanotechnology uh, has very little to do with uh, all of this. Uh, and in order to see this, uh, I think it's interesting to focus on some early examples of nanotechnology. Uh, some of the earliest examples of nanotechnologies are uh, centuries old, um, even millennia old <laughs> at this point. Uh, and um, uh, there are some artifacts, some ancient archaeological artifacts that actually use the nanotechnology to achieve uh, specific effects. Um, so, for example, uh, you can see here this Roman artifact, it's called the Lycurgus cap, uh, and it is a, a decorative Roman cap that was built by using uh, um, a material known as dichroic glass. Uh, and the dichroic glass is essentially constructed by dispersing very tiny nanoparticles of gold and silver inside of glass. Uh, so here we have one example of nanotechnology that was built in 400 AD. Uh, this is another example of uh, nanotechnology. Uh, this uh, material was uh, prepared by Michael Faraday in the 1850s, uh, and this is an example of uh, ruby gold. So again, ruby gold is essentially a suspension of uh, tiny nanoparticles of gold um, uh, with a very controlled and uniform size of around six nanometers that are dispersed in, uh, in a liquid in water. Uh, and uh, uh, by exploiting uh, or by, let's say, from um, as a result of certain quantum mechanical effects, uh, we can see the, the creation of this red, uh, uh, of this red color. <clears throat> Similarly, uh, nanotechnology was even employed in the construction of uh, uh, ancient stained glass windows, even in the Middle Ages. And by changing the nature and the size and the shape of the nanoparticles dispersed in glass, uh, uh, artisans were able to uh, obtain um, a wide variety of different, uh, of different colors. Uh, so uh, the question, uh, I guess, comes naturally, um, how is it possible to achieve such precise control of the nanoscale without uh, direct uh, atomic manipulation? So clearly, in all of these examples, the people that made these artifacts uh, did not have access to uh, scanning electron microscopes or, uh, or scanning tunneling microscopes, nothing uh, of the sort. So how were they able to achieve such precise control of the nanoscale? Uh, and the answer to this question uh, is uh, precisely the concept of self-assembly, self-organization uh, of material systems. Uh, so what is uh, self-assembly? Um, I, I very much like this uh, definition of self-assembly that comes from a paper that was published in Science in 2002. Um, in which the authors define self-assembly as the autonomous organization of components into patterns or structures without a human intervention. Self-assembling processes are common throughout nature and technology, uh, and they involve components from the molecular to the planetary. So again, as I mentioned earlier, self-assembly is really, a, um, let's say, a universal uh, phenomenon of matter that appears at all scales uh, and uh, um, that, re that uh, involves uh, the ability of matter to form complex uh, structures without uh, uh, direct manipulation of the components of the system. There are two kinds of self-assembly, uh, and you can see this here from this diagram. The first kind of self-assembly is uh, known as equilibrium self-assembly or static self-assembly. And the second kind of self-assembly is known as dynamic uh, self-assembly. So I will give you some examples of both kinds of self-assembly. So uh, maybe you will understand a bit better what uh, this distinction actually means. Um, the first kind of self-assembly, uh, as I said, is static self-assembly. So static self-assembly essentially takes place uh, or arises from the interaction between uh, different components of a system at equilibrium. Uh, so what does equilibrium mean in this context? Essentially, it means that after the formation of the system, there is no more energy exchange with the environment. Uh, so you can think, uh, um, for example, 
example of uh, like one common example of this uh, uh, is of course the crystals uh, if you think of uh, sugar for example you uh, probably have sugar in your pantry uh, and uh, the sugar in your pantry um, once it is formed once uh, it forms its uh, crystalline structure it doesn't change uh, it remains uh, in its uh, static uh, crystalline form uh, it only changes if you take the sugar and you put it in a warm cup of coffee and therefore the sugar crystals will, will start to break down. So essentially, um, stat in static self-assembly, uh, structures, uh, self-organized structures do not need any energy from the environment to maintain their own uh, self-organized uh, um, self structure, but uh, they will only change it uh, if the conditions uh, around uh, the material systems are no longer favorable to maintain uh, the self-organized structure in place. Uh, and this, of course, leads to systems that have uh, a programmable and predictable behavior. Some examples of this are, for example, viruses, um, any kind of uh, artificial nanoparticles, such as those uh, metal nanoparticles that uh, you can find uh, in stained glass windows, even soap bubbles and uh, some components of living systems, uh, such as the cell membrane of uh, um, the lipid membrane of cells uh, and uh, uh, proteins uh, that fold uh, into specific structures uh, by exploiting the phenomenon of static self assembly. So, static self assembly, because of its, uh, let's say, predictability and programmability, is one of the most uh, uh, significant strategies in nanotechnology because it allows us to build uh, from the bottom up complex material systems without uh, direct intervention. All we need is to create and produce uh, um, the right conditions for the complex structure to form. Uh, and uh, this is especially relevant at the nanoscale because manipulating individual atoms and molecules uh, is uh, extremely energy consuming, time consuming, and uh, in many contexts, uh, even completely impossible to, to do. Um, on the other hand, uh, dynamic self-assembly uh, is a much more complex, I would say, and um, but although a very interesting uh, kind of, uh, of self-assembly. Uh, in dynamic self-assembly, um, the material systems uh, um, that self-organize are um, far from equilibrium. So what does this mean? Uh, it means that in order to maintain their ordered structure, uh, these material systems need to continuously exchange energy and entropy with their environment. Um, so for example, uh, all kinds of uh, living organisms are examples of uh, um, dynamic self-assembly because in order to maintain their structure, they need to continually produce, uh, consume energy. Um, and uh, in, of course, they have a metabolism uh, that uh, allows them to dissipate the energy and as a result, maintain their order structure. Uh, there are also, however, examples of dynamic self-assembly in non-living and even inorganic systems. And this is especially interesting, I think, uh, because for a long time, uh, this kind of uh, uh, dynamic self-organization was exclusively associated with the living uh, systems, uh, but we are now more and more realizing uh, that there are several examples of dynamic self-assembly, even in non-living and inorganic materials. So one example of this is, for instance, this chemical reaction known as the Belusov-Zabotinsky reaction, in which uh, um, two, rea uh, two reactants essentially form uh, these complex patterns uh, that evolve in time. Uh, another example is a phenomenon known as uh, rayleigh bernard convection, uh, in which essentially a liquid, when it is heated from below, uh, spontaneously forms uh, these uh, ordered hexagonal cells, uh, and the molecules of the liquid somehow start uh, exhibiting a coherent uh, motion. They self-organize in this uh, uh, complex coherent motion. Uh, and you can see this depicted uh, also in the pot of, of spaghetti. Uh, and um, so this is especially interesting because again, uh, it shows us that dynamic self-assembly is not an exclusive property of, uh, of life, of living 
these systems. And these systems are also interesting because compared to the um, static, uh, statically self-assembled counterparts, uh, they are also somehow non-deterministic because the structures that they form are, are always uh, unpredictable. Um, so there are not many examples of dynamic self-assembly in artificial systems and in technology. Uh, dynamic self-assembly is still uh, a concept that we are learning uh, to, uh, to produce, uh, to reproduce artificially. Uh, however, there are some examples of this, uh, and I would like to show you um, an example that actually come, an example that actually comes from the field of nanotechnology. Uh, but I am not sure that I can show you this video. Um, let's see, maybe, ah, okay. Yes, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so here you can see uh, these tiny particles uh, are uh, made of uh, polystyrene. So essentially they are made of plastic. Uh, they were dispersed in water. Uh, and uh, um, there is a laser beam that is uh, hitting this, uh, this uh, suspension of plastic particle. Uh, and as a result of the energy provided by the laser beam, you can see that uh, these um, plastic uh, nanoparticles start to self-organize, forming these regular ordered structures. And as soon as the laser beam uh, is no longer hitting the sample, this self-organized structure completely breaks off. So this is an example of dynamic self-assembly in a very simple artificial system. Uh, another interesting feature of uh, this uh, specific uh, system, of this specific example, is that uh, um, this very simple system somehow seems to exhibit uh, some very complex, uh, unexpected uh, behaviors. I will show you this second video and you will see what I mean. Um, so uh, here you can see this blue area um, that uh, essentially highlights uh, a specific pattern of uh, self-organized particle that is growing inside this sample. So you can see that as time moves on, uh, this um, blue area is uh, slowly increasing. You could even say it is self-replicating um, and it is slowly growing uh, by effect of the energy provided by this laser beam. Uh, so as time moves on, however, um, you, uh, you will see that another pattern uh, suddenly appears. It is different. You can also maybe see it uh, with uh, just, uh, just by looking at the different patterns. Uh, and these two patterns somehow started to enter in, into some kind of competition with the one another. Uh, so the red pattern seems uh, um, to start growing more and more. Uh, until at some point uh, it uh, completely uh, takes over the blue pattern and somehow completely swallows uh, this, uh, this blue pattern. Uh, so this was especially interesting to observe uh, because uh, it is an example of uh, uh, how dynamic self-assembly, even in very simple material systems, uh, these are just uh, nanoparticles of plastic, can exhibit very complex behaviors. This behavior is uh, somehow reminiscent of uh, uh, evolution by natural selection. So this uh, specific red pattern somehow is faster uh, in uh, its uh, own self-replication and it is able to take over the blue pattern. Uh, so we can see how even a very simple system uh, through dynamic self-assembly can exhibit uh, uh, very complex uh, uh, behaviors that typically we only associate uh, with uh, living systems. Um, so uh, I hope uh, that uh, I have explained to you um, the, the different ways uh, in which self-assembly is a very surprising and interesting phenomenon. Uh, and um, I would like to, to conclude my talk uh, by describing uh, um, in what way uh, working at the nanoscale and the exploiting uh, um, self-assembly of um, the self-assembly of, of nanomaterials uh, can actually open uh, new uh, unprecedented opportunities for technologies. Uh, and I would also like to highlight uh, how these new opportunities for technology are actually very different from uh, 
uh, the misconceptions associated with uh, nanotechnology and uh, the idea, for example, of uh, uh, direct atomic manipulation of uh, replicating um, uh, tiny machines uh, on the nanoscale. So I would like to, to, to explain to you and show you uh, in what way nanotechnology can actually give us a completely different idea of what technology could potentially be. Uh, and uh, in order to do this, uh, I have decided to, um, to pick uh, three uh, examples, uh, let's say, or three main uh, keywords uh, or three main ideas uh, that I believe uh, are especially relevant and will be increasingly relevant in the field of nanotechnology in the future. Uh, the first is uh, smart materials. Uh, and uh, there are very different kinds uh, of, uh, of smart materials, uh, both uh, natural and artificial. Uh, I have um, here I have put this uh, picture of the spider web, which is one of my favorite uh, natural materials, and I always talk about spider webs. Uh, and I will tell you why. I believe that the spider silk uh, is actually uh, the perfect model of uh, smart materials. Uh, secondly, um, I, uh, I would like to discuss with you again this idea of the relationship between matter and information. So if you think again of, uh, for example, uh, Richard Feynman's idea of uh, uh, nano lithography and of writing uh, information on a very small scale, um, I would like to give you here another perspective on the relationship between matter and information. Uh, and in order to do this, I would like to start from the example of the virus. Um, viruses are self-organized nanostructures uh, that can actually um, help us to understand uh, the relationship, the actual relationship between matter and information. Uh, and finally, um, I would like to give you some, uh, some hints about uh, the concept of uh, synthetic life. Uh, of course, uh, the idea of, uh, of building uh, completely synthetic uh, living systems uh, uh, is uh, still something that is completely speculative, uh, uh, but I believe uh, that uh, there, are, there are already some interesting uh, examples of uh, the way in which uh, nanotechnology can help us uh, somehow um, uh, cross the boundary between living and non-living materials. So uh, starting from the concept of smart materials, uh, let's start with spider silk. Uh, so spider silk uh, might be considered as a natural nanotechnology. Uh, and what do I mean by this? Uh, it might sound a bit paradoxical, but uh, actually um, uh, spider silk uh, has a very um, complex structure uh, that uh, I believe uh, is probably the perfect model of uh, uh, a nanomaterial or what a nanomaterial should be. Uh, spider silk is really one of the smartest materials in nature. If we can call a material smart, of course, <laughs> this, is, um, this is an interesting uh, question to answer, of course. Um, and the reason why I believe that spider silk is a smart material is the fact that, first of all, it is able to adapt to environmental stimuli. Uh, for example, it is uh, able to change its mechanical response uh, depending on the condition, uh, on the environmental conditions. So, so for example, if an insect hits the spider web, the spider web will respond by rearranging its internal structure uh, to improve its mechanical properties as a result. Um, spider silk has a self-assembling complex structure. Uh, so one of the most interesting aspects of spider silk is the fact that if you, look, if you could look at it um, with a special um, magnifying lens, you would be able to see that its structure is, ex is extremely um, complex. Uh, it is composed essentially of proteins uh, that um, self-organize uh, through a process of static self-assembly in different uh, domains. We have some ordered domains here in yellow, and then we have some more flexible uh, domains or flexible parts of the material that provide uh, uh, spider silk with its uh, uh, specific uh, stretchability, let's say. And all of this uh, uh, complex uh, hierarchical structure actually emerges uh, spontaneously. 
So the spider really um, only needs to extrude the, the spider silk uh, and this complex structure uh, produces, produce it, uh, produces itself uh, by spontaneously by, by self-assembly. Um, spider silk is also a, a self-healing material. Um, after being damaged, uh, um, when uh, spider silk uh, is, um, interacts with water, for example, after, uh, after rain, um, it is able to, to self-heal its own structure after, after being damaged. Uh, and also it has been speculated that spider silk uh, might uh, be some kind of uh, extended cognition or extended mind for the spider because the spider uses the spider silk as uh, some kind of external sensing organ that allows him or her or it <laughs> to, to perceive uh, its own environment. Um, so uh, this, of course, was a natural example of smart materials, but there are several examples also of artificial uh, smart materials. Um, one, example of, one example of this uh, is this um, so-called slime robot that was uh, developed uh, actually this year in 2022. Uh, and this robot is essentially composed of magnetic nanoparticles dispersed in this kind of uh, polymeric slime. Uh, and this robot can actually be uh, remote controlled and it is able to uh, manipulate uh, individual objects, uh, move around uh, even in uh, small spaces, and it might have uh, a lot of applications, for example, in the biomedical field. Um, then uh, moving on to this idea of the boundary between matter and information, uh, as I said, uh, uh, viruses, I believe, uh, are uh, one of the most significant examples of the way in which uh, nanotechnology can help us uh, cross the boundary between matter and information. So viruses have uh, this uh, um, self-organizing structure that is able to essentially assemble and disassemble depending on the environment in which the virus finds itself in. Uh, and this is the key. Uh, for uh, the virus uh, to deliver information inside, uh, in genetic uh, information, of course, for its own self-replication inside of living cells. Uh, and actually, we are already able to exploit uh, this uh, same concept, uh, this same idea in a technological concept context uh, and uh, the, um, the example, the main example of this uh, that I would give uh, is uh, uh, um, RNA vaccines. So all of us have, have been somehow exposed to um, RNA vaccines for COVID-19 um, and uh, essentially these kinds of vaccine exploit nanotechnology by building these kinds of uh, uh, lipid nanoparticles uh, uh, made essentially of fat molecules that contain uh, the mRNA sequence. And essentially these nanoparticles, exactly in the same way as viruses do, are able to uh, disassemble once they come in contact with our cells. Um, another way in which nanotechnology can help us harness uh, uh, or somehow um, exploit uh, or move around this boundary between matter and information uh, is um, um, an emerging field of technology known as DNA data storage. Uh, and the DNA data storage is essentially the idea of using DNA, DNA molecules, uh, for storing digital information. Uh, and this has a lot of, uh, of advantages because uh, DNA is extremely information dense compared to our traditional approaches for storing information. And nanotechnology can actually help us uh, to um, realize this uh, process of data storage. Um, I have reported here an example of this rabbit, which is composed of a uh, plastic material in which uh, are dispersed these tiny nanoparticles uh, made of glass, essentially silica. Uh, and these tiny nanoparticles contain or um, uh, have been encapsulated with uh, DNA. And this DNA essentially encodes for the digital information required for the reproduction of the same rabbit. So this has been called uh, the first example of DNA of things. So this is the idea that we can use uh, DNA data storage to uh, essentially um, provide even non-living objects with uh, 
uh, some kind of uh, record of their own, uh, uh, of the way they were built and constructed in order to allow us to then uh, replicate the same objects. And finally, uh, just a few words about the synthetic life, which is a whole uh, uh, complex topic, of course, and uh, um, I, I will not be able to go very in depth uh, in this field, which, uh, however, is extremely fascinating. Um, essentially, the idea of, uh, of uh, synthetically reproducing living systems uh, is based on the possibility of reproducing uh, the three main functions uh, of life which are, first of all, metabolism, secondly, uh, segregation. So the idea of creating uh, material systems that are, are somehow separated from their own environment, uh, and finally, self-replication. Uh, so even though there is, uh, to this day, no um, artificial system that really combines all of these functions together, um, however, through material science and nanotechnology and by working at the nanoscale, we have been able to uh, produce, uh, to engineer at least uh, uh, some of these functions. So, for example, here you can see these self-assembled uh, um, vesicles, self-assembled uh, um, bubbles, uh, nanobubbles, uh, that essentially um, can uh, self-organize and then break down and then self-organize again by exploiting uh, some kind of artificial metabolism. So this system somehow combines metabolism and segregation. And here you can see another example of uh, nanotechnology trying to reproduce certain functions of life. Uh, these are some self-replicating nanofibers that were composed of uh, uh, polymer building blocks. And essentially in uh, this paper, researchers, shows, researchers uh, showed that uh, um, nanoparti uh, these nanofibers can actually self-reproduce and even enter into some kind of uh, evolutionary competition uh, with uh, one another similarly to what we saw uh, previously with uh, the self-assembled uh, uh, plastic nanoparticles. Um, so to conclude my talk, uh, I would like to go back uh, to the ideas around the nanotechnology that were introduced uh, by Richard Feynman's uh, talk. Um, and I would like to, to propose uh, an alternative view of nanotechnology. So um, my, my idea, or I would like to title this, uh, this slide, this final slide as plenty of agency at the bottom. Um, so in uh, the view of uh, proposed by Richard Feynman, uh, um, there was of course complexity, this idea of complexity as the, at the nanoscale, but complexity was interpreted as a sum of multiple independent parts. Uh, there was this idea of information storage, but only as uh, nanolithography. So an idea of information storage where uh, the materials are actually only passive substrates uh, for the inscription of uh, information. Um, then there was the idea of the miniaturization of macroscopic uh, mechanical machines. Uh, and finally, the idea of the direct manipulation of individual atoms. Uh, and the, the alternative view that I would like to propose in the light of uh, what we saw today uh, is first of all, the idea again of complexity, but not as a sum of individual components, but as a network of interacting parts, as a network of relations. Secondly, uh, the idea of information uh, that uh, is no longer uh, encoded on passive substrates, but it is encoded through active material interfaces. So um, uh, the materials actually actively participate in the process of information storage and the transformation of uh, and the transmission of information. Uh, secondly, instead of miniaturizing uh, macroscopic mechanical machines, uh, I think that maybe we should start thinking of uh, different technologies, for example, smart and soft materials, so smart and soft robots. Uh, and finally, instead of thinking of direct manipulations, manipulation of atoms and molecules, um, nanotechnology and working at the nanoscale really invites us to think of static and dynamic self-assembly uh, to build uh, complex uh, uh, material systems. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, of course, if you want to get in touch with me, this is my email and uh, I am open for all kinds of questions. Thank you so much, Laura. That's, that's really excellent. Um, 
so much, uh, so much to go with, <laughs> uh, so many things. Um, so for everyone out there in the audience, if you could put your questions um, down in the in the question box, I've got a sort of question perhaps to throw out to you um, while everyone's getting their their ideas together, um, and it's perhaps to uh, try and maybe bring together some of those things you mentioned at the end, which is like, so what would you see as the sort of political intervention that this this uh, analysis of the nanoscale nanotechnology and ideas about nanotechnology um, has? Because a, lo a lot of what you seem to be talking about, and I think you mentioned this uh, in the book, is this idea of sort of yeah. decentering the human, moving away yeah. from these kind of dominant ideas of I'm a human and I'm going to do stuff to technology. Absolutely. So, so perhaps could you speak a little to that? Yeah, I, I, I really believe that um, our view and our relationship with technological objects uh, has a lot of uh, political implications, of course, and our view of technology really impacts uh, also our um, our social and cultural lives, right? Uh, and um, I believe uh, that uh, a lot of views of technology that really focus, for example, on uh, top-down assembly, top-down organization of, uh, of machines, of technological objects, uh, really come from a certain uh, tradition, let's say, of our relationship with matter that uh, um, also has some, I would say, very strong patriarchal uh, um, narratives associated with it, right? And I see the possibility of uh, using self-assembly uh, as a way to, um, to, to construct a new relationship with the technologies and non-living uh, materials, uh, even um, yeah, non-living objects, uh, as, a, as a way also to somehow overturn this, um, this anthropocentric view of, uh, of what technology means and what technology can do. Um, and um, yeah, by, I think that like by giving agency to, to technological objects, uh, um, we can actually try to, to reimagine our relationship with technology that is no longer based on the idea of uh, human dominating matter, uh, but again, a more cooperative and extended network that involves both human and non-human um, agents, let's say. Yeah. And this is where it kind of comes into that idea with the book of like questioning what 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 does intelligence mean exactly, if we yeah. start to look at these behaviors. Kind of, um, yeah, the starting point of uh, questioning even this idea of centralized intelligence uh, that um, we we find a lot in uh, in our technologies today, even in uh, digital technologies, uh, and uh, the, of course the typical architecture of. Uh, uh, a computer, a uh, von Neumann, Neumann machine, mm -hmm. uh, and like trying to think of different kinds of technologies that have more decentralized uh, um, structures. Uh, and uh, really, nanotechnology and the working at the nanoscale really challenges us to rethink uh, the strategies that we use to build the complex systems. Um, so instead of uh, individually controlling the components of the system, uh, letting uh, um, the system uh, produce its own uh, uh, order and its own uh, um, balance of, of forces. And this, uh, I think, is, of course, valuable at all scales, uh, um, even, of course, at the social and political scale of how do we organize uh, a society or an economy, of course. Mm, yeah, yeah, great. Um, there's a question. Um, if you want to have a look, you can see them yeah. in the in the thing. But I'll read it out for everybody right. else. So it's a question from Piotr Spuna. He says this was great. Um, the DNA uh, data storage uh, is fascinating. Uh, memory, individual and collective, both of which are always extended and externalized in surfaces, uh, is more than storage, but circulation or interaction. So he says, in the DNA of things, are there efforts focused on interaction? Um, and has, has any attention been paid to the connections with, with human bodies, brains, etc.? Yeah, so um, I agree with you that, uh, I mean, I find I, I recently um, came across this idea of DNA data storage, uh, and I, I've been looking around this concept because I also find it extremely fascinating. But again, uh, most of the research that I have found uh, is uh, mostly related to the idea of uh, uh, simply encoding and storing uh, the data uh, without uh, um, 
without having an actual uh, active uh, participation of the material also in the in the interaction or circulation of uh, of the of the data being stored one example that i found that is especially interesting and that maybe might answer a bit your question is uh, uh, there is there have been uh, some attempts of encoding uh, um, information digital information in dna uh, and then uh, um, by using a CRISPR technology, uh, transferring these pieces of DNA into living uh, bacteria. Uh, and then uh, um, the living bacteria or this uh, yeah, bacteria colony, then by replicating and reproducing was actually able to uh, carry on and uh, multiply the information. So in that case, it's not only passively encoded into the material, but uh, the, the materials, let's say, support of the information also self-replicates and somehow contributes to the, to the, to the reproduction of, uh, of this information. And then also possibly um, to the transformation of, of this information. Uh, in the case of human bodies, uh, um, there is not really, yeah, like human, uh, um, the human element in this is not really I think it has not really been explored yet, uh, and it, there is, has been mostly a focus on, uh, yeah, in objects uh, and uh, this example of bacteria. I hope this uh, somehow answered your question. Yeah, I think so. There's actually, I think, a slightly kind of follow-up question to that from John Vandenhout. He mm -hmm. asks, in your opinion, what is the most impressive human-made exploitation of nanotechnology? I don't know whether it is this one you're talking about or whether you have some, <laughs> another one. He says, um, and what upcoming nanotechnologies are you excited for? Wow, That's okay. another question, but I'll perhaps throw that one out there. Yeah, yeah. no, actually, um, wow, it's really hard for me to, to really uh, focus on one single uh, nano, nanotechnology. I can try to give you this is not an answer to the question. <laughs> it's more okay. like of an indirect uh, um, comment on your question. Like I think that that there there has been a lot of uh, so in nanotechnology there has been a lot of hype around the specific materials, um, and you maybe you have noticed I haven't talked about graphene. Uh, because uh, um, no, because like typically. Um, I mean, of course, graphene is one of the most uh, fascinating materials that we know. Like, but I honestly, to me, all materials are are somehow fascinating in their own way, right? Uh, but uh, there has been a lot of hype around specific materials, and there is this idea of like finding the um, the, the next uh, super material that will change completely change the world. Uh, and um, honestly, I think that this view. Um, is uh, has always been kind of disappointing because in the end, um, I think that uh, instead of looking for one single material, what now technology is doing more and more is like trying to combine different materials in more complex material systems to solve specific uh, uh, specific problems. Um, and so there is not really one single material or one single nanotechnology, uh, but uh, I believe that uh, it is more of a of a collective and and uh, cooperative uh, work. Um, one uh, field, uh, there are a few fields of nanotechnology that I find uh, particularly interesting. Um, one field uh, deals with uh, um, uh, human technology interfaces, uh, and I am especially interested in the idea of uh, using nanomaterials uh, to encode uh, information and uh, maybe also to produce uh, uh, new interfaces with technology. I, I really like this idea of uh, smart tattoos uh, uh, using quantum dots, uh, for example, to uh, write or encode information into our bodies or using uh, or building new devices uh, that uh, really interact uh, with our skin and allow us to really build a more continuous interface with uh, digital technologies. Um, and uh, um, and yeah, I, so this is really one of the fields that I, that I, that I am really interested in uh, right now. Um, and, um, uh, and yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I had another one. No, artificial life, of course, is another interesting field that is still very speculative. And of course, no, another field that I really, 
uh, enjoy and uh, I mean, I'm always interested to see what will happen next is this field of soft robotics mm. uh, and the idea of uh, building uh, um, actually yeah, robots uh, that uh, have uh, um, smarter and smarter bodies. So mm. most of the robots that we build today still have some kind of centralized uh, control uh, system. Uh, and I am interested to see, I, I see there are already some examples of uh, more and more delocalized uh, robotic uh, systems and I am really interested in this. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because it makes me think of like, there's just how you finish the book, that first part, perhaps everything where you, you ask, or you kind of call for, and I quote, less ambitious, but cunning and flexible kind of technologies. And I thought that kind of summed, summed that up really yeah. nicely. So we have another question uh, uh, about self-assembly, does that make sense, from Joshua DeCalio, who was our, uh, one of our keynotes from yesterday. So he says, I appreciate the turn to self-assembly here, since I agree that it pushes against some of the strange and clearly non-scalar and human-centric assumption originally performed by Feynman and Drexler. I was wondering if you could talk more about this. Drexler's opening move in engines was to discuss bulk technology from molecular technology on the basis of our ability to handle individual atoms and molecules with control and precision. Even if we don't accept this possibility of uh, miniaturizing, it still doesn't seem clear where, how, and if control at the nanoscale enters. As you note, self-assembly pushes at these conceptions of control, but there is a, a tension here that can, can be seen between, as you noted, the ability to build from the bottom up complex structures with great precision, and the fact that this is, quote, without human intervention. So there's a lot going on there, but how would you describe this move from bulk technology to uh, nanotech and what are nanotechnologists doing? Well, okay. perhaps you could uh, have a go at, at Yeah, uh, okay, we do try. Yeah, no, it's a very interesting question and I, I think I see, um, I see uh, the point here. So uh, it is true that uh, even uh, through approaches of self-assembly, I mean, of course, we are, we are still using some kind of human control, even though it is an indirect degree of control. I think the main difference between what Drexler proposes and the contemporary strategies of nanotechnology uh, somehow also has to do with uh, uh, this idea of, uh, um, of uh, let's say, the, the statistical interaction of, uh, of different elements in a complex system. So. Uh, in Drexler's view, uh, the, the aim and the goal of nanotechnology is completely eliminating any kind of uh, uh, probabilistic or pr prob yeah, statistical effect in order to achieve a precise uh, uh, control of each component of the system with complete deterministic uh, uh, behavior. Um, on the other hand, uh, in a self-organizing system, uh, um, the order and complexity emerge from uh, a probabilistic interaction. So it is not uh, a precisely controlled uh, system, but it is always uh, the result of, uh, um, uh, let's say, a statistical interaction of a large amount of elements. So in Drexler's view, you have these nanobots moving around individual atoms and molecules to eliminate completely what uh, Drexler calls this bulk effect. Um, and this is a, a concept that also Feynman proposed. So this idea of completely, um, so yeah, Feynman, if you read the plenty of room at the bottom, there is this part uh, that uh, as a chemist, I find <laughs> very offensive. No, I'm kidding, but like, <laughs> this idea that like chemistry is this kind of very primitive science because all that chemistry does is just mixing things together steering them together and then waiting for things to happen. You know? And uh, what Drexler and Feynman would like to have is a technology in which uh, every single atom and molecule are precisely controlled. And this uh, statistical uh, probabilistic element is completely eliminated. But uh, on the other hand, uh, nanotechnology now exploits the techniques of chemistry more and more. Th this idea of self-organization emerges from the statistical interaction of a bunch of different elements uh, in the same way uh, that uh, chemistry um, creates chemical reactions by mixing things together without actually looking with, at what is happening, just uh, letting the, the system uh, do its, uh, its thing, let's say. I'm not sure if I answered the question, but... Uh, 
that certainly that certainly gave us uh, spoke to many of the bits of it. I think, and um, we have another question from Jeffrey uh, Hondradakis, who asks um, if you, uh, he asks if you might be able to speak more to the implications of how you see nanotechnology leading to an understanding of information as encoded through active material interfaces. So this appears to push against the more classic information theory position regarding a desire to eliminate the noise of the channel as much as possible in the sending and receiving of signals. Does this active interfaciality of the material interface have any implications for this isolation of noise from signal in informational systems? It's thinking of particularly, particularly of recent work from Cecile Malaspina, uh, among others, in talking about the constitutive function of noise. Yes, uh, so I think this somehow relates to the previous answer. So um, this idea of information as only resulting from the elimination of uh, yeah of noise, so of probabilistic uh, non-deterministic effects. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, is uh, in the context of nanotechnology quite uh, uh, outdated. Again, uh, the idea of the first uh, uh, the first idea of nanotechnology that Feynman proposed uh, uh, in relation to information storage was really just uh, a simple uh, um, writing process, uh, and this is very literal and very uh, limited now compared to what nanotechnology can actually do. Uh, but uh, um, of course. It, information storage in material systems is much in actual material systems and you can see this uh, by looking at also living uh, living systems is much more uh, it's a much more complicated matter and um, also uh, this idea of um, we, we talked about the dna data storage um, so i think like uh, also in biology there is a notion of uh, information as uh, being only uh, somehow stored uh, or written in DNA, right? And this idea of uh, information being uh, uh, written into some kind of code, uh, again, I think is a limited view of the relationship between matter and information because uh, by studying and looking at the complex material systems, we can see how information can emerge from uh, um, a variety of effects that have nothing to do with uh, codes or with uh, writing. So if you think of this, uh, the, the self dynamically self-organized system of, uh, of plastic nanoparticles that we looked at during the talk, you can see the, the emergence of this complex ordered patterns that exhibit complex, uh, some kind of evolutionary complex behavior without uh, any kind of uh, written information storage, right? So I think that now technology really challenges us to rethink uh, uh, our idea of information. Uh, there, there are kinds of information that are not uh, written uh, anywhere and that uh, somehow are encoded in a more delocalized way inside of material systems. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see what you mean. Yeah, this idea of like, it has to be the Encyclopedia Britannica seems to be yeah, so exactly, kind of like, yeah restricting the way he's thinking about this and um, just the previous question Josh says uh, he thought it was a great answer he said he wasn't expecting you to uh, talk about probability and found that really uh, an interesting way of, of approaching that idea and um, there's no other questions there so I actually had a, another question of mine just to kind of bring things back to where you started and that kind of cube slowly kind of becoming a, what seems to be a sort of liquid of 60 million uh, square centimeters of um, and I was wondering about this this idea of surfaces. So you talk about surfaces, and I think elsewhere you've sort of talked about this idea of, and I don't know whether you stick with these terms, but kind of surface-oriented ontology or metaphysics of surface, and sort of seeing surface as this kind of really key key idea that that comes to life when we think about the nanoscale and this idea of like uh, matter being sticky at the nanoscale, and that, that that idea you had of these surfaces which are sort of uh, not surfaces in the, the way we might think of them at the meter scale. And so I was wondering whether you could just talk a little bit more about that as the, this, this kind of central idea that surface could play in a kind of more sort of broadly philosophical uh, way based on, on your work. Of course. Um, so yeah, this idea of surface, like uh, so this uh, 
I think like the, the um, what I find especially interesting about nanotechnology is exactly, of course, this idea of, uh, of the interface and how it uh, challenges uh, our notion of the interface also. So um, the, the word the interface uh, is like a word that we, we use a lot in our everyday language in relation to, uh, for example, interfaces of, uh, um, of um, digital uh, electronic devices, digital technologies, and typically our view of the, of the interface between human and, and technology is like always the screen. So like this flat, uh, extremely thin, uh, uh, space uh, that becomes more and more invisible, right? Uh, uh, and uh, I believe that uh, nanotechnology somehow overturns this idea. So instead of making uh, this interface uh, between human and technology so thin that it is invisible, uh, we make it uh, extremely large, extremely complex, uh, and uh, we use this uh, surface space uh, as an active space of technological transformation. And I think that uh, somehow in, in terms of uh, the, let's say the philosophy of technology, this uh, suggests the idea of, uh, um, again, a relationship between human and technology in which there is a mutual uh, transformation, right? So as uh, in the case of uh, two materials coming into contact with one another and somehow merging together by forming this new hybrid uh, um, object or this new hybrid material, uh, I think the same happens between us uh, and our technologies uh, so that mm -hmm. when we come in contact with the technological interface, we are also somehow transformed and we become, our identities become something uh, entirely different as a result of the interaction with, uh, with technology. So uh, this idea of the surface to me um, in the context of, of technology is really significant because somehow it's, uh, it suggests uh, how, um, how technology actually constructs uh, our own identities. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I've also wondered, uh, um, do, do we even have identities uh, in ourselves before this encounter with, with the world and with technologies and with uh, uh, let's say outside of, of the interface, right? Because uh, um, if we think again of this water droplet uh, changing its behavior depending on the surface on which it is deposited, uh, mm -hmm. we can really see that uh, it's really hard to, to, to define uh, the, the, the actual identity of this water droplet outside of this space of interaction. So the, the, inter the surface or the interface really becomes a space where our identities somehow are constructed. Yeah, 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 I see, I see. And so I, I kind of, I, I've been asking all of our speakers to, to speak to this, so, um, uh, but to bring it kind of to some sort of concrete um, sort of idea. And I, I was quite interested in your mentioning of graphene and the way you sort of don't want to talk about graphene, but uh, everybody else wants to talk about graphene and that there's kind of a, this idea of it as a sort of wonder solution and that we're, these kind of there's going to be one solution that's going to change the world or and everyone's kind right. of kind of looking for this. Um, and yet at the same time, I, I think, you know, in the book and, and here today, you talk really wonderfully about the kind of tiny changes in, say, spider silk, uh, spider silk, you know, just a tiny genetic change that can be linked to the whole species. And so it's not really a wonder, uh, so something wondrous is this tiny, tiny thing Absolutely. that could have a, have a huge difference. And, and so I suppose what would be like for you in terms of thinking about these big scale problems? of the world, I don't know if we want to take climate change or pandemics or whatever, what would be the way that you would want us to think about technology? Like if it's not, this is the, the wonder technology, this is the thing that's going to save us. Do you have a kind of a way that you think we should think about technology that would be a more helpful um, of way of conceiving of things? Yeah, so uh, this is a great question and actually, um, yeah, I, I mean, I in, in my book and in, in my work, I have focused a lot on this idea of uh, material culture. So the idea that the materials that we build and that we construct uh, are not uh, really separate from our cultural identity and social lives and political lives, but are really an integral part of uh, what we are as uh, humanity. Um, and uh, yeah, I really like what you said about uh, about uh, the, the difference, let's say, between this these uh, wonder materials and like these tiny changes uh, in um, that can really gradually transform our approach to, to technology. Uh, and um, I believe that it is, it is really, so 
let's say wonder materials don't have a, a great history in, in the history of humanity. We think our, I think the last wonder material that we had was plastic. Uh, and now <laughs> we are dealing with a, with a huge uh, plastic problem, right? No, it's mm -hmm. true though, because like, yeah. um, it, uh, it was like considered as the material that was going to change the world, right? Uh, and so it did, I just think- just not quite in the way we hoped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, it, it did, it really did. So uh, clearly that is not the right way to, to, to think about material culture. Um, I, I think like it's maybe similar to what happens in, uh, in uh, biology, you know, in ecosystems. Uh, uh, so if you have a, a, a large monoculture of one thing, uh, this is going to, to destroy everything else. And I think it's kind of the same in, in terms of material technologies. Um, this, uh, I think it's, there is a danger in like trying to, to construct our whole view of, of, the, of, the, of the technological uh, future on one single material. Like for example, the same problem now is arising with lithium lithium and lithium batteries so like we really need to rethink our idea of, of materials and trying to um, also diversify our 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 diet of materials and trying to use all kinds of materials that surround us uh, even uh, uh, materials from a biological origin I am especially interested interested in like bio hybrid or bionic materials uh, and uh, trying to to also build uh, this uh, this kind of connection with uh, unconventional uh, unconventional materials around us uh, but overall uh, every time that a new materials material comes along uh, we really need to to think of it uh, as a, an active part of our culture not simply as a tool but we really need to think of its implication on a global scale as much as possible. Uh, and of course, it's not easy to do, but uh, it's it's probably the only way, uh, the only way to go, <laughs> clearly. Yeah, yeah. Look, that that has been fantastic. There's been there's so much Thank to think so much. about. I think the questions really show like there's, there's so much to, to, to be working with uh, here, even as it's so small. Um, so thank you once again. I'm sure the audience uh, will, will join me in, in, in extending their thanks uh, to you. Um, to everybody else, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we have a, another panel starting uh, very shortly. And for the upcoming keynotes, I'll be passing on with my chairing duties to Magdalena Krzysztofowska, um, who were the co-organizer uh, co of this conference, uh, who will be taking things on uh, from there. Um, but for now, thank you very much. Um, and uh, we'll call it, call it a day. So goodbye. And thank you again, Laura. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>